Let's go. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. I'm your host, David Horsager. Join me as I sit down with influential leaders from around the world to discuss why leaders and organizations fail, top tactics for high performance, and how you can become an even more trusted leader. Today's show is sponsored by Sourcewell. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. It's David Horsager. I've got a special guest today. We've been in a kind of a mastermind, a unique group together. He is a five time, five exits as an entrepreneur, valuing over $200 million in exits. He's the co founder of Planet Post Labs. He's a venture capital uh, investor. He's a professional level jazz guitarist, and he's a twice named Ernst and Young Entrepreneur of the Year. He is a creative troublemaker. Please welcome Josh Linkner. Thanks for being here, Josh. David, truly a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Well, he's he's a leader I trust. He's a really just he thinks differently. And uh, you know, Josh, that's that's one of the things I, I think your uh, way. As we talked about innovation and creativity, and you've had your hand in so many things. Many people say focus, 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 and you're kind of this. Richard Bronson in a way, right? So how do you, you certainly show the creativity, but how does that mix with focus? Well, you know, it's interesting. Creativity often is a mashup of things. In fact, the name of my, you know, consulting business, Platypus Labs, a platypus, the animal, it's got like the bill of one animal and the tail of another animal. It's kind of this weird mashup. And actually creativity is often like that. So when people get super focused in a particular discipline, they actually become less creative. And it's really the people who can borrow from lots of different parts of life and, and put it in the blender and shake it up in a different way that, that ultimately yield even better creative results. So for me, it's been a blessing, not a curse. What, do you, what, what are you doing at Platypus these days? So we help organizations around the world, people like Cardinal Health and Honda, and, and of course, smaller groups as well, um, build a culture of innovation. We help them tackle tough challenges and seize new opportunities by giving them the tools uh, to innovate forward. So we help, help sort of build this, this skill set, uh, this resource of creative problem solving and inventive thinking to help them grow and help them thrive. Inventive thing. I'm going to get down to personal in a little bit to you because I know we we both are on the road a lot. You, I can remember the day, at least one of the days. You, you know, you were flights and helicopters and everything else to make four big events in one day. But let's stay back there. What 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 is innovative thinking? What does that mean? Okay, I I, I want to be more innovative. Everybody listening wants to be more innovative. We want to have also, you know, if we didn't see the pandemic coming, uh, pandemic coming, we sure wanted to be able to pivot in the right way at the right time. How do we think that way? How do we become more innovative? Well, first we got to dispel a couple myths. So one myth that I hear all the time is innovation only counts if it's a billion dollar idea or if it changes the world. And that's nonsense. We can be innovative, not just on the big stuff, but on the small everyday stuff. And in fact, when you're innovative on a daily basis, you can do little teeny micro innovations. It, it, it de-risks the process. You build critical skills because you get better at it. It becomes part of who, you, of who you are. And all those little advances add up to great stuff. So I encourage people often to think small, first of all. Second of all, it's the, the research is crystal clear that all human beings have enormous reservoirs of dormant creative capacity. Now, we, we can be creative in different ways. Like I play jazz guitar pretty well. I can't draw a stick figure if I tried. So just because someone listening doesn't, doesn't do creativity in the classical sense of like, you know, oil on canvas, doesn't mean you can't be creative as a salesperson or a finance person or a customer service person or a mom or a, a, a community leader. And so when we think about everyday people becoming everyday innovators, that's when I light up. That's what I'm all about. It doesn't have to be the next Elon Musk. You and me and our kids and our spouses and everyone on our team, we can all be innovative. And that's, that's to me, the real beauty of it. So how do you, how do you encourage your team? Like I, I, we want our team to be more innovative. We certainly created in in one of our business units a massive pivot this year, and uh, I was so proud of them. And it was a part of you know partly brought on by the pandemic. But how do we create that? How, how do you, the the micro like give us an example? Maybe run us through what would be a micro innovation today. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. Again, I call these big little breakthroughs, which is the title of my next book, Big Little Breakthroughs, How Small Everyday Innovations Drive Oversized Results. And uh, let's take a trip together. Let's hop over to London. So imagine you're walking through the streets of London. You're marveling at the architecture and there's bustling crowds and all this history. And then you look down and what do you see? You see cigarette butts all over the ground. It turns out that cigarette butts are the biggest 
litter problem in central London. And in fact, many, many cities around the world. And all the things they've tried to do to stop this problem really fail, like finding people or shaming them into compliance. And, and you might think it's just unsightly, but it, it's harmful for the, uh, the environment and you know, small kids or animals can ingest them and it's pollutants, all these bad things. So here's an example of a big little breakthrough. There's a guy that I interviewed for the book named Trowen Resterick. And Trowen is an average everyday dude. He's just like, he's not Elon Musk. He, he, he went to college and barely got through. He took an ordinary job. He's trying to pay the bills just like all of us. But, but Trowen had this, this kind of passion for the environment. So he saw this little problem and he decided to solve it with a big little breakthrough. He invented something called the ballot bin, which is a bright yellow metal container mounted at eyesight and the, the front of it is glass and it's, there's a divider down the middle. At the top, it's a two-part question such as, which do you prefer, hamburgers or pizza? And there's a little receptacle where smokers can vote with their butts. So you put your cigarette butt in whichever slot, like you, which food you like better, and, and you can see an instant tally based on how many butts have stacked up underneath it. And of course, you can customize this to any two-part question. It could be, which is your favorite sport? Or, or you know, do you prefer blondes or brunettes? Whatever two questions you want to ask. Here's the thing. When these ballot bins have been installed, they reduce cigarette litter by 80%. And they're now in 27 countries. And the thing I love about this story is like, it didn't take six PhDs and a billion dollars of capital and material engineering degrees and resources and equipment. This is an average person. Like you and I could have easily thought of that idea. And here's somebody who is not famous. He's a normal person that's using creativity to make a difference in the world. And when I hear stories like that, it's so much more inspiring to me than watching Elon Musk or, or, or Jeff Bezos make an extra billion dollars because that feels inaccessible, whereas Trowin is totally within our grasp. So I love that. Is there a process? And once again, the book is called Big Little Breakthroughs, How Small Everyday Innovations Drive Oversized Results. We will link exactly where you can get it, along with all the information about Josh Linkner and his companies at the show notes, trustedleadershow.com. But is there a process to, to just think a little more creatively, a, a, a process to think a little more innovatively to kind of, you know, I think part of it almost is like believing I can, but well, is there any process you could give us? There is. And in fact, really, that's the whole source of my body of work over the years. And, and of course, this book, I tried to demystify it. You know, we think of innovation as like wizardry, like you have to be imbued by the gods with some magical powers. It's actually much more like a magic trick. When you see even the best magicians, they, they don't actually possess magical powers. They've learned a skill. And, and the truth is that all of us can learn to develop that skill. And so the book goes into, we sort of dissect, like, how does an idea happen? What are the individual components? What happens when you put it under the microscope? What does the research say? And then I really walk people through the eight core mindsets of everyday innovators, which are sort of easy to digest, easy to get, get your arms around uh, mindsets that people can put into action. And furthermore, we go into, into depth on tactics. You know, most of us use brainstorming as the, this is the preferred tactic. By the way, brainstorming was invented in 1958. I'm guessing we need an upgrade. Like a lot of things have changed since 1968. So I, I actually have this whole thing called idea jamming. I have this whole like idea toolkit where we pro provide much more fun, modern exercises for like idea extraction, which, um, but, but long story short, there absolutely is a process and methodology by which all of us, and I mean, all of us can become more creative. So, you know, they give us this, we got to have a little secret sauce here. We can't go through all eight today, but uh, you know, everybody's going to hear it. And that'll be called as, as my friend JLB says, the sauce, because we're going to tell people, but you, you, you know, this, the full secret sauce is in the book, but what is maybe one or two mindsets first, and then maybe one tactic like, oh, I can see how this would be helpful. I can see some. So can you give us a couple mindset shifts first? Yeah, absolutely. Again, I, nothing secret here. I'm happy to share the secret sauce because I actually really feel like I'm on a mission to help people become more creative and I'm, I, I'm happy to share. Uh, so a couple of the mindsets, and these are uh, studied through over a thousand hours of research and interviews with CEOs and celebrity entrepreneurs. And we dove into, you know, how does, how does Lin-Manuel Miranda and Lady Gaga and Banksy do their art? So, so it's, it's well-founded well in, in, in substance. Um, but a couple of mindsets I'll share. Um, some of them uh, are more intuitive. There's one called start before you're ready, which is essentially the notion that everyday innovators don't wait. They don't wait for permission. They don't wait for direction. They don't wait for a perfect game plan. They get going and then they course correct and adapt along the way. Uh, but there's some actually more, more strange, funny ones. One is called Don't Forget the Dinner Mint, 
which is the notion that before you ship a piece of work product, it could be an email, it could be a keynote speech, it could be a financial report. What could you do to plus it up? Like what's an extra teeny little extra dose of surprise and delight, of creative surprise and delight that, that makes your work transcendent? And the, the return on investment is gigantic. That's a high leverage uh, activity because a 5% extra dose of creativity could yield 100% or more uh, results. Another fun one real quick in terms of mindsets is I call it use every drop of toothpaste. Use every drop of toothpaste. And the notion here is around being scrappy. It's sort of you doing more with less, figuring out how to be resourceful and using ingenuity rather than relying on external resources. You know, when I talk to people about being innovative, most people say, I'd love to, I want to, but I don't have fill in the blank. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough raw materials. I don't have enough degrees, et cetera. And so what this does is actually turns that on its head to say, okay, what can we do when we are resource constrained? And by the way, I've thought about this many times. Think about this. If the amount of external resources you had equaled your level of creativity, the federal government would be the most creative organization on the planet and startups would be the least. And of course, we know the exact opposite is true. So those are a couple of mindsets. There's eight of them, but those, those are a couple of ones to get love you started. It. I love it. So, so if I take one of those, is there a tactic like we can, we can start to use tomorrow? Like, is there a tactic? Like, let's start at that first first phase even. I, 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 or, or maybe the brainstorming tactic. I'm, I'm thinking about thinking through a problem. How can I think about this problem more creatively? Yeah. So the, the techniques that you use, think of them as tools. And let's say you, were, you had an oil well in your backyard and, and you got, you know, the, the, the little plastic shovel from your kids from the beach. Like that's going to take you an awful long time to get to oil and you're not going to fully extract it. Obviously, if you had commercial grade equipment, different story. So brainstorming is the equivalent of that, that plastic shovel. It's just not that good. So let's let me share some tools that are much better. Uh, here's one for you. It's fun. It's called the judo flip, the judo flip. And so the judo flip is basically as follows. You take a look at what, whether you're facing a problem or an opportunity. Write down what are, what are the things you've always done before? What does conventional wisdom dictate? What do most people do? Then draw a line down the page and just ask next to each entry, what's the polar opposite? What would it look like if you judo flipped it? And that oppositional thinking, just forcing yourself to consider the polar opposite of what most people do can be very, very liberating. Just a super quick story that I just read like two days ago. Um, turns out there's 65,000 Chinese restaurants in North America. So how in the world, if you own one, do you stand out? Well, most people, what they do, the average, average thing is people are, they use a lot of puffery. This is the best ch Chinese chicken in the universe. It's the world's best, the New York City's best egg roll, whatever. And it's a bunch of puffery. And we all have strong BS detectors, to your point of trusted leader. And we shut all that down. So in this particular restaurant in Montreal, next to every entry of, on the menu, there's a printed something called owner's comments. And so he did the opposite. He judo flipped it. So one of his comments is, I don't really like this dish. I think you'd prefer the other one. Another one's like, this one's a little, little too much salt. I keep trying to get him to use less of it. Another one is, don't try taking this thing home. It gets really mushy. Another one is, you might think this is authentic, but honestly, it's not authentic at all in this particular dish. And so he gives these brutally honest, completely transparent commentary on his own food. And first of all, it's hysterically funny. It separates him from the competitive set. Here we are talking about this one out of 65,000 Chinese restaurants, not because he did what everybody else does. It's because he judo flipped it. So just a couple other quick tactics, because I want to make sure people are armed for battle. Uh, another really fun one. So, okay, we get together to brainstorm. And what do we do? We share our, our safe ideas, not our crazy wild ones. And largely because of fear. Fear is the single most uh, poisonous force that holds our creative thinking back. And, and by far, that's a bigger blocker than natural talent. So actually, two really fast ones to break through that. Number one, I call it role storming. Role storming. So role storming is brainstorming in character. You're taking on an actual real world brainstorm challenge, but doing it as if you are somebody else. So David, instead of you being David in the room, and now you're saying, well, I'm going to be judged by my ideas, or what if I say something that looks foolish? You're playing the role of Steve Jobs or Hemingway or Darth Vader. And so you could pick any character you want, real fictitious. It could be a sports hero or a movie star, whatever you want. And you literally pretend that you are that character because when you're that person, you're no longer responsible for the idea. It's not a reflection on, on your, you as a human being. So that's a really fun one, yields amazing results. The other one I'll just share real quick, it's called the bad idea brainstorm. So we get together for a brainstorm, presumably we want to have good ideas, but we generally anchor them in the past and we end up having these kind of puny incremental ideas. Here's the way it works, two-step process. Step one, everybody in the room sets a timer, like eight minutes, whatever, and brainstorm bad ideas, not good ones. What's a terrible way to solve it? What's the worst possible thing you could think of? What's unethical and immoral and illegal and, and you know too expensive or whatever? So you come up with just terrible ideas. 
It's hysterically funny. The whole team is energized. Everyone's laughing. And you fill the boards with all these awful ideas. Now, importantly, step two. Step two is where you then take a minute and look at all the bad ideas and say, wait a minute, is there a little gem in there? Is there a little something? Is there a pattern, a nugget that I could flip to, to take it from a bad idea to a good one. So the idea here is you take your creativity, wait in the edges, and then yes, you're ratcheting it back to reality later on, but it's much more effective than fighting the gravitational force of going bottoms up. Fantastic. I love. I am enticed. Trusted leaders are enticed. I mean, this is, this is really, 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 really great usable stuff. What I love about Josh is uh, grounded in research like we love out of the Institute, but also usable tomorrow morning. And so I, I love it. Hey, it's Ann with the Trust Edge team here. As you know, we are passionate about helping you and your team perform at your best. And that's why David wrote his new book, Trusted Leader. This true-to-life parable follows the story of a CEO who uncovers the root issue threatening his organization's success. And in the back half of the book, David provides a roadmap for even how to solve those root issues. Get Trusted Leader for your team, your organization, or even just for yourself at trustedleaderbook.com. So, you know, Josh, You've sold businesses, combined value of over a couple hundred million dollars. What you've you know written New York Times bestsellers before. You you're doing all these things. You've been a part of a hundred startups, or uh, whether that's intimately or you know VC or uh, certainly advising. And so, tell what's it take to have a successful startup today? Well, it's a lot of it is opposite of what you think. You know, first of all. We think that it's about uh, an entrepreneur that fills the room that's charismatic like Steve Jobs. Actually, the best entrepreneurs are much more thoughtful, often not that larger than life. They're humble. They, they give credit to others. It's not about themselves. It's about the success of the team and the business. They lift other people up rather than push other people down. So I think one thing it takes is an open-minded, coachable, you know, humble leader who has empathy and compassion. Uh, and again, these are skills that you don't often associate with business success, but I truly believe that they drive, drive results. I think another thing is that a real commitment to your to the customer. I've heard so many companies talk about the financial model and how much money they're going to make, and then you're like, "Well, how are you helping a customer?" Like what? And and I think not losing sight of that. You know, you're you're there to serve. Any business is there, whether it's a service or product, to to, to deliver value to to real paying customers, and and not just in a way that they're an annoyance that well, you're just trying to cash their check. It's that you're really there. You know, your heart's got to be into to providing real value to them. And so when you push the creativity on, on providing real value to customers, I think that's something that sounds so obvious, but is often missed. I think that was the Einstein quote. We've heard it before, but you know, don't work so much at being a success, work at giving value, right? And uh, um, a, a huge key. In fact, one of the things we saw this year, especially last year, uh, the pandemic and everything is we noticed empathy is more important than ever before in leaders. And in fact, our, our annual study found 90%, 92% of people would trust their leader more if they were more transparent about their mistakes. People stop at transparency because, oh, transparent. No, it's not transparency. It's transparent about their mistakes, willing to admit when they did it wrong and willing to lift others up when the team succeeded and, and defer the good, right? Yeah, can I actually, Dave, can I tell you a quick story about that? Uh, it's so it's it's a very personal one for me and it's about a screw up that I did. I didn't write about it in the book or anything. I just thought, I was thinking about you today and, and your incredible body of work around trust. So uh, I was building my company. It was called ePrize. We were sort of like half ad agency and half software company. And at, at one year, I set a bonus program up that was terribly flawed. Like it was awful because it was binary. If we hit the target, I think it was like $40 million in revenue at the time. Everybody got a sweet bonus. If we missed it by one penny, everybody got, got nothing. So again, ill-conceived, totally my fault. I was the CEO. But it did work to like drive performance. So we all anchored around that goal. Every, we had charts and graphs and scoreboards, and we were gun and hard. So on December 31st, David, I get a call from my CEO, uh, my chief uh, sales officer. So he says, Josh, we did it. We hit the 40. We're like at $40,200,000. And I got to tell you, like I was deeply moved, not because I was greedy. I didn't care about the money, honestly. I just was like, proud of my team. We accomplished something together. And so I immediately fired off a note to everybody. Congratulations. You guys did it. Everyone's getting their bonus. So the bonus, according to the plan, was going to be paid like 45 days after the uh, end of the year. So we could, you know, get the accounting straight and all that. So about a week before the bonus was to be paid, my CFO comes a knocking. He says, Josh, you know that $40 million? I'm like, yeah, wasn't it great? He says, yeah, we got a problem. He said, turns out we double counted one deal and we didn't calculate for a particular cancellation. So instead of just making it, we actually just missed it. 
Now, keep in mind, I already told my team like weeks before that they were getting this bonus and, and they like put deposits on new houses and sent, you know, signed up their kids for camp or whatever. So I go to my board of directors and I said, guys, like, here's the situation. And their first response was sweet. We don't have to pay a bonus this year. And, and by the way, this is over a million dollars of cash uh, uh, collectively. And, and we were successful, but we didn't have like, you know, a giant, we weren't Amazon. Like we didn't have lots and lots of extra money. This was a meaningful amount of money. And so I, so they said, and, and rightfully so, by the way, they, I'm not pointing blame at them. They were a fiduciary board. And they said, look, you don't get a Super Bowl trophy for almost making it into the end zone. And we have to you know, celebrate accountability. And, and like, we didn't hit the result. You, you don't get the championship. And I said, I hear you. And I agree with that. I said, however, to me, the only thing that supersedes accountability is trust. I told all those people that they are getting their bonus. So we had an ethical debate for a while. And then I finally said, look, put aside what's right or wrong, because if you look yourself in the mirror, you know what's right. But let's just look at the economics here. That million dollars, I argued, was gone, whether you like it or not. If we don't pay the bonus, it's going to come out in the form of bad morale, employee turnover, someone will walk off with a laptop, like it's gone. Or we can look at it as an investment in who we are. You know, you really show your character when things are tough, not when they're good. And now is the time it's tough. So for the next week, David, it was like the Cuban Missile Crisis. I was taking heavy artillery fire from my board of directors. But here's what that ended up happening. I gathered my whole team together. At the time, I think it was about 500 people or so. I explained in absolute detail. Here's the email I got. Here's the numbers. Here's the cancellation. Here's the date and notes from the meeting with my CFO. We did not make the bonus. Everybody is legally entitled to zero. And by the way, totally my fault. I own it. I buck stops with me. I'm not pass pass any blame. I said that after a pause, I said, however, the only thing in my mind that's more important than accountability is you have to know that I have your back and that we have each other's back. So therefore, we are paying every penny of that bonus on time. The motion in that room that day, like there were tears streaming down people's faces. I was getting bear hugs from grown men. And, and, and I did it because it was the right thing. But by the way, best million dollar investment I ever made. Because years later, people were like, if we had a tough problem with a client, people would work all night on it. And, and people would pour their heart and soul. We had almost no voluntary turnover. On job interviews, candidates would come in and say, I heard what you did. I, I want to work there. I never told the story to anybody. But my only point is that when we think about trust, at least I understand you know, your body of work, to me, it's not only the right thing. And by the way, it is the right thing. But besides that, in addition to that, it's also good for business. And I, again, I just really admire the work you're doing. And I just wanted to share that story Thank to a degree. You. I guess that might be using creativity, but, but you know, that, that, yeah. that's what happened. Undeniably. Well, we argue it all the time. We believe a lack of trust is the biggest expense in an organization or an individual, even a global government on a corruption issue or whatever. So uh, that affirms that, you know, I'm not, this is your interview, but you did make me think about something I don't share very often. And, and this whole transparency kind of... Uh, humility thing. And it's not a shout out to me, but I just, I remember this. My daughter, we're out for a walk. She's maybe 13 years old. My oldest, she was oldest at the time. She's now 18. But she said, um, uh, we were just talking and she said, you know, this was a time when I was really busy in her years. I was flying all over the world and we, we were maybe at the height of our, as far as just a speaking business. Now we're, you know, doing all these other things too, but, but basically, um, and uh, she said, dad, you wouldn't understand I don't know if she was talking about boys or academics or what. You're perfect. And right then, my heart sunk because I knew it's great to be their hero at three years old, but at 13, we got an issue. And she hadn't seen. She saw me fly out. She saw me do this. She saw me, you know, get picked up by a sedan or whatever. And I, 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 um, she hadn't seen when I lost all of our money, uh, you know, buying a business that uh, we lost everything on in two weeks before she was born. She didn't see me do this, do that, whatever. All the things my wife and everybody else knows, <laughs> you know, right? And she, didn't, she hadn't seen some of this. And, and I, I made an intention on our walks and I just started sharing some place I blew it. Now, by the way, she's 18. She's seen plenty of things. But I mean, at that time she was, you know, you're coming out of that when you're a perfect dad thing to, you know, and you're, and, um, and she, uh, I, I just started sharing. I blew it here. I missed it there. I was imperfect. I didn't. I wish I would have treated my team better here. I wish I would have done that differently. And what happened to our relationship? It just changed forever. And now she shares things with me. And now, you know, I think there's this whole thing on like that bad news you shared. Of course, a big part of that story is you followed through above and beyond. But there is something people say, um, you know, be transparent or, and they want to connect. And we don't connect on greatness. 
that you were an all-state football player. We don't even connect on that you sold companies for $200 million or this or that. We connect on the mistakes. Oh, I can relate to that. Oh, I did that. And that that's what I, I bring that back to your startup. The, one of the first things you said on startups was we really, the best leaders are often humble, thoughtful leaders. And I can say the same thing about the, the, the CEOs that I work with or know, um, you know, you're so you're so spot on, and not only is that again, you know, deeply connecting at a human level, it also back to my my love of creativity that drives creativity. As I mentioned, you know, fear is the biggest blocker, and so if if a CEO says, "I want your creative ideas," and then but but the person doesn't feel safe sharing them because maybe they're going to get sent to corporate timeout, like you have no creativity. Fear and creativity cannot coexist, and so the best leaders, um, it's not they don't think of that that their organization's creative. Uh, uh, atomic particles are just themselves. It's everybody. Everybody's an innovator. And to do that, they have to create a safe culture. Just a quick example, back to your point about screwing stuff up. One company that I work with issues every team member two corporate get out of jail free cards each year. And here's what they say. They say, listen, creativity is everybody's job. And, and to have good ideas, we're going to have to have some bad ones. We're going to have to have some, some screw ups. So I want you to go out and take responsible risks. That's part of your job. And when you screw something up, because you will, Hand us a card, you're off the hook, no questions asked. And on the annual team uh, uh, performance reviews, a leader will be disappointed with a team member if they haven't used both of them. So in this case, they sort of built a system around responsible risk-taking and that it's okay to scrape your knees from time to time. I love it. Reminds me of way back when I was just starting to do some research. And if you remember MCI, the mobile, the phone company, the, the the new president, the new president made a six hundred million dollar mistake, and they asked the the the, the chairman and the board. They said, "Are you gonna? I mean, are you gonna fire him? Look what he just did. I mean, it was a big blow, it right." And and they said, "No way. We just paid too much on his education." <laughs> so it's kind of that. Oh, okay, we're gonna make this safe to try and and um, whatever. So. So, you know, there's more to you I and mean, we, we could talk business all day and we don't have a lot of time left and we got leaders, uh, you know, we, we talk about high trust leaders and and you've been around many, you are one. What about you personally? What, what we, we, you know, we talk a lot about how um, to be, uh, to really lead others, you got to be able to lead yourself. How are you leading yourself these days or trying to? at home, personally, you, we both have kids, we both try to be healthy physically, spiritually, emotionally. What, what are, what's, maybe you got one or two routines you'd share. Sure, well, the first thing, you know, back to the being, you know, open and transparent is it's not easy to do that. You know, like there are days you just wanna, don't feel like working out and you wanna eat greasy pizza. Like, you know, I mean, so let, let's, you know, back to you, you, your daughter's comment about you being perfect. Let's not hold ourselves to some level of perfection. And then when we fall short, inevitably we're angry or, or disappointed or shamed, nor should we hold other people that way. So I think the best thing we can do is just recognize, first of all, that we're all, we're all human beings. Um, that being said, I try to, I have an accountability partner. I, I switch it every year. Um, people in my group. So we keep a little mobile app. We, 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 it's called Tally. It's free if everyone wants to download it. And we set up our key metrics that we're going to track each week. And then every week we take a screen grab and, sh and share it with each other. So we hold each other accountable. A couple of mine are you know, healthy eating. I try to do four out of seven days a week. I try to do four days of exercise a week. I do 100, or 210 minutes of learning every week. So it's really critically important to me to, if you want to change the outputs, they say you got to change the input. So I'm always learning, reading, et cetera. Um, I do a, a morning ritual every week, every Every day to uh, to get myself sort of in the creative groove. So I'm all about sort of those daily rhythms and habits. And obviously, I talk a lot about how to do that creatively in the book. Uh, but uh, I think also holding yourself and, and having an accountability partner is very, very helpful. Accountability. It's so fun to hear you say that. I, I don't hear that all the time. And we, you know, I talk about in, in my new book, Trusted Leader, I talk about the accountability a group that changed me. And I've been with them, these four guys for 28 years. And I'm a better wow. husband, a better parent, a better leader uh, because of it. Hey, it's Sam from the Trust Edge team. Most training and development initiatives don't last or even solve the root issue hindering your organization. That's where Trust Edge coaching certification comes in. Trust Edge coaches are equipped with a suite of tools to identify, benchmark, and close gaps in trust for good. Because when you solve the real issue, you get measurable results in a culture where people actually want to make an impact. So whether you're a coach with your own clients or a leader training people inside your organization, check out TrustEdgeCoaching.com and see how you can start solving the root issue and get lasting results in your business. And now back to the show. 
Josh's book, Big Little Breakthroughs, How Small Everyday Innovations Drive Oversized Results. Hey, we got to get uh, toward the lightning round here. Ready? Fire away. How are you? You're the expert in innovation and creativity. What's something you're doing today to keep innovating or being creative yourself? Well, so I still play guitar all the time. It's my one muse. Although, I, by the way, everyone can have their own muse. So if someone wants like digs poetry or interpretive dance, do whatever you want, but connect with something that really inspires you creatively. Um, part of my rituals that I do, it's I have a five minute a day creativity ritual. I won't go through every element of it, but just two real quickly, one minute a day of guzzling creative inputs. So I might stare at a painting for a minute. I might go to YouTube and watch a live music performance or hear someone do spoken word poetry. I figure I just let myself soak in the creativity of others. And then I also do a, a like creative calisthenics, almost like jumping jacks. I give myself a, a, an assignment for one minute. So like, what are 13 alternative uses for a pencil? Or if you ran, uh, if you were the president of Jamaica, how could you double the amount of Olympic gold medals you could win that year? So just the, they're, they're not designed to have practical work product. It's designed to keep your, your, your creativity sharp. So again, the, just those two minutes a day, those alone really fuel my creativity and I think can be helpful to others. Uh, those would be absolutely helpful. And I can hear what people are saying right now. They're saying, oh my gosh, where am I going to find that? I, I want to guzzle the creativity. I'll take the five minutes, but I think it's going to take me two hours to find the interpretive dance, right? So what what, what are they going to, where, where are you going to start on your five minutes just finding it quickly? Because you know where you can end up with YouTube is just watching cat videos. So what's the, what am I going to do? Oh my gosh, it's so easy. So just pick a medium. By the way, you could make them like Monday is art day, Tuesday is poetry day. So make, you know, give yourself less decisions and literally go to YouTube and I type in like jazz saxophone solo and just see whatever pops up. Don't, don't spend hours and hours looking for the best saxophone solo in the history of the universe. Just watch someone play great music. And by the way, then YouTube will start suggesting other things. I've gone down, as we all have down rabbit holes. If you start populating with great creative works, instead of looking at cat videos, you're gonna watch some amazing 16 year old singer from Sao Paulo do a beautiful bossa nova riff. So it's pretty cool. Love it. And the other on the other point, uh, you know, I think a lot of people are going to say, well, I don't think in terms of, uh, you know, 13 alternative uses of pencils and and how I can uh, get 18 more gold medals from Guam, you know. So how uh, what what am I going to start with? Because I think those are great. Le this is your next book. It's a it's a it's a question a day of, hey, wake up and think of 13 uses for pencils other than writing. What, what, what do you what do you think? What? Where do you find that little spark? Because you're already creative. A lot of people that are listening are saying, I want to be more creative. I want to, I want to work this muscle, but I don't know where to start. Yeah. So just real quick, you absolutely hit it right. Work that muscle. So personally, I believe that we're all creative. I don't think I'm more or less creative than anybody else. I may have developed my skills more because I spend more time focusing on it, but I'm no more creative or less than anybody else. So, which is good news because that means we all can learn this skill, just like all of us could learn a new language or learn to jazzercise or learn to play tennis, you know? So th to do it, start simple. You're exactly right. Start simple. Try this for 30 days in a row. Try to think of, you don't have to do it. Just think of one teeny tiny mini mini creative thing a day like for example next time you order a pizza say hey could i get the pepperoni under the cheese instead of on top all you're doing is thinking of something totally small that is different than what exists today you're challenging yourself to think about what's possible instead of what is that's it love it 30 days one idea you'll you'll be a game changer all right we're going to come back to lightning round in one second before we do we got to go for the producer question did you think of what we were talking kent hey josh uh, so I was, I was wondering, you know, you work with a lot of, you've worked with a lot of startups, a lot of companies. Um, do you see a common or a, a common mistake that startup um, founders make in the early stages that they could avoid and actually be able to grow a lot faster, a lot quicker? I absolutely do. And uh, there's two quotes. They kind of say the same thing. One is a Zen. No, I'm sorry. It's a Chinese proverb. It says, chase two rabbits and both will escape, which is essentially they try to do too much stuff and they end up failing. They're not being world class at it. And the other quote that is actually a venture capital quote is more startups die of, of indigestion than starvation which is exactly the same thing. They try to go too fast, grow too big, take on too many projects, and they just end up scraping their knees. They haven't built this foundational infrastructure to, to do that effectively. So I'm certainly not suggesting anybody slow down. That's not the goal here, but it's to, 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 to be deliberate and thoughtful. My first book was called Disciplined Dreaming, which is really this yin and yang concept of, yes, you absolutely need dreaming. You need to be 
swinging for the fences and all that, but there's got to be discipline as well, or else you become unhinged. So it's got to have that that sort of left and right brain balance, I think, to, to proceed diligently and just don't try to bite off more, more than you can possibly chew. I agree with that 100%, and I've been challenged by it several times in my life, right? So um, absolutely. Can you, can you tell us, before I get back to the lightning round, actually, just maybe think of this. You've had a lot of success. You've built a lot. You've sold a lot. You're sitting a lot. But you can't hardly be a venture capitalist and not see or have been a part of failure. Can you tell us about a failure that you were personally a part of and what you learned? Oh, man, I, we don't have enough time. I've got so many failures. And I just want to be clear. I've interviewed billionaires and yeah, they, they, they win more maybe, but they also fail more. So we have to really recognize and celebrate that failure is part of the innovation process. I started a company called Fuel Leadership. It was going to be like Coachella, but for business people, totally failed, lost my shirt on it. I, I started a technology inside my previous business called Caffeine. It was going to be like a self-serve technology for small businesses to do the type of work we did for big companies, totally failed, lost my shirt on it. So on and on and on. I mean, I've made huge mistakes. Um, but I think one of the biggest things I learned, frankly, is you can't be sheepish when you go back after it. You know, you, you have to actually go back with, with the same vigor that you had in the first place, because if you're taking your failures with you to the next time at bat, you're almost ensuring the next failure. Um, I will say this real quickly, though, in the venture side of things, I almost said like a social experiment. So there's this all this debate. Is a startup success the jockey or the horse? In other words, the team or the entrepreneur or, or the technology or the product. So almost identical timing, I invested $600,000 each into two separate companies. One company had an A team and a C idea. The other company had an A idea and a C team. Like clockwork. The person with the C team managed to screw up their A idea. I lost every single dime. I took a total zero. The other one, eight person C idea, managed to pivot and adapt their C idea into an A idea. It became one of the top performing companies in my portfolio. They're still rocking today. They're wildly successful. So go figure. Great example. Love it. All right, here we go. Back to the lightning round. So much to take away here. Everything guzzle creativity every, every morning. Uh, a, a host of, of, of ideas from big little breakthroughs, Josh Linkner's new book, and a whole lot more. Here we go. Your favorite book or resource right now? I, so I'm a crazy reader. I know you are too, David, but I just started reading Adam's Grant, Adam Grant's new book called Think Again. Uh, I'm like, 30% in and I'm totally addicted. I love the guy, but he was a fellow Detroit uh, person originally, but I think he's just brilliant and I love his work. Okay, I'm taking another veer off the, off the uh, lightning round because Detroit, I mean, you talk about, you're right there in the middle of a turnaround city. We get to see, and we work with, trust you know, we work with cities. We've got some of the biggest cities in the world, even countries, uh, we're doing trust edge work, but you've firsthand seen what a turnaround in Detroit. Can you speak to that for a second? Yeah. So I was born in the city of Detroit, not the suburbs, the city, as were my parents and grandparents. And I've had the chance to leave a lot of times. I always wanted to stay and be part of it. Like this is a city with a soul. And it's funny, like, uh, you know, hundred years ago, Detroit was kind of the Silicon Valley of our country, but frankly, we lost our way and, and it gets back to creativity and innovation. Instead of creating cool cars, we started like administering automotive corporations and we built these stifling bureaucracies and you name a problem, we've had it from racial divisiveness to political corruption, to public safety issues, all kinds of bad stuff. But, but in the, just like when there's a forest fire, you know, it, it makes way for new growth. The, the city of Detroit right now is in, in, in an incredible period of renaissance. There's art galleries and buildings and construction and like there's life and it's just cool. And so we still have a long way to go. It's not utopia, but it's absolutely on the upswing, partly because we are reinventing. We're not just trying to rebuild the old Detroit. We're finally getting on with the hard work of creating a new one. All right, back to the lightning round. I love that. I'd love to talk more about Detroit. I've, you know, it used to be my least favorite uh, city to fly through, and now it's uh, moved up the ranks. And that's just a, uh, you know, flying Delta, you end up there a little bit. Uh, you, you know, going east, we're either Atlanta or Detroit often. So um, I know you spend a lot of time on Delta, like I do, or have. When you're not flying private, I, I'm pretty sure. So let's uh, let's jump back in. Here we go. Favorite, cur a favorite. There's so many, but a favorite tech gadget or app right now? Uh, I'm going to get back to Tally. Uh, it's just super easy and I keep a really clear sense of what I'm doing and it just keeps me focused. Like, okay, did I get my reading in for this week? Did I do my daily workouts? You know, like it just keeps me focused and it's just, it's not glamorous and it's just super effective. The only, only one I just say, sorry to add too, is, um, is Audible, which is not new or anything, but just 
to, to be able to consume content when you're in an airport, when you're on the treadmill, when you're whatever, it's just a wonderful gift for us to, to make, to compress time. And so I'm constantly listening, even when I can't be reading. Absolutely. Way back to Zig Ziglar calling it Automobile University. Now you can do it anywhere while you're walking, listening, driving, flying, and um, you can get your book that way. Remember, trustedleadershow.com. You'll get the show notes, Adam Grant's new book, and Josh's new book, and anything interesting we've talked about like Tally or Audible. Next up, best advice you've ever been given. You know, my, my grandmother gave me a piece of advice at one point, which is sort of this. She said, no matter what situation you're in, uh, classroom, business, athletic field, somebody has to be the best. It might as well be you. And it wasn't in any way being cocky or arrogant. It wasn't like that. The, the intention of it was don't let your own lack of belief hold you back because everybody on that field or in that classroom has the same belief system. And, 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 and don't cap what your possibilities are. You know, give yourself permission to really go for it. And, you know, she's long past, but I've always carried that around with me. And I just think it's, you know, it's something very meaningful to just like, hey, let's focus on what's possible. Don't benchmark yourself against what you think, you know, the minimum threshold is. You just see, if, see if you can go even further. That's up. My mom said something similar and it was always go the extra mile. Anybody can do it halfway. Right. But love it. Someone has to be the best. It might as well be you. I'll just say real quickly, there's a little flip on that, that um, I, I, I've given this advice. It was one saying that I repeated again and again and again as I was building my many companies that someday a company will come along and put us out of business. So it might as well be us. So I flipped my grandma's quote a little bit, but the notion is basically that we, we have to recognize that success is a temporary state in the context of many external factors that today are changing at a rate like none other in history. And so I think it's incumbent on all of us, both in organizationally and individually, to like put our previous selves out of business. I truly hope that I put myself out of business. The Josh of today, six months from now, I'm a different person. I hope you are too, David, because we're always progressing. Abraham Lincoln, I hope I'm not the man tomorrow that I am today right? I want to be getting better, learning, changing, growing. Love it. Two more questions. Here we go. One bucket list or hope for the future? Josh Linkner's hope for the future. Well, I think we've all been uh, sucked into the political uh, discourse over the last several years, and I'm not making a, a, a party commentary, but back to your point about trust and empathy and compassion. I just hope that we can find some of that. I hope that we can start finding the good in each other instead of slinging the, the arrows. I think that we, we've got to be able to unite in this country around the things that really matter that, that are going to set our kids up for our future and, and, and set ourselves up as a nation and stop just fist fighting and slugging it out in the mud. Um, to me, it's been really disappointing just because, you know, my kids see, see this type of thing and, you know, insurrection and all that. Again, I'm not making a political comment at all. I just hope that on both sides of the aisle that we can inject some more empathy and trust and compassion. Um, I think it's desperately needed in this world. Undeniably. I remember so enjoying sitting next to my dad and watching the debates. And then I embarrassingly am showing my kids some of what's happening in the last few d different years of debates. And it's uh, like, boy, I don't want them to act in certain ways. And um, certainly so. Hey, before we give the last question of the day, best place to find you, Josh. I know we'll link all this in the trusted, uh, trustedleadershow.com show notes. But best place to find you or find out about what you're doing these days. Yeah, simplest and easy to remember is just biglittlebreakthroughs.com. Uh, there's all stuff about me there, but but there's also a free creativity assessment. There's all kinds of toolkits and goodies. Um, there is a password required to get to the really good stuff. And so I'll make password for everybody listening today, trusted. So if you go to, there's like, it says toolkit and you have to enter a secret code, just use the secret code trusted. And I know you could put that in the show notes, but um, it's tons of free access to all kinds of goodies and worksheets and tools that hopefully can help everyday people become everyday innovators. And we are continual learners. I'm excited to go all the way through this book. We'll be doing it here. It comes out uh, for everybody in April, but you can pre-order it right now. So with that, the final question, it's the Trusted Leader Show. Who's a leader you trust and why? You know, there's a leader of one of the companies that I started. I don't know if this is like the, the all-time best in the universe or whatever, uh, but his name is Paul Glomsky. He runs a company called Detroit Labs, and we helped get that company off the ground, provided the early seed funding. And he's one of those guys, again, he's not larger than life. He sort of trips on his words from time to time. You think of him as sort of understated, but this guy is just, the, the he's a, to me, an exemplary of being a trusted leader. He walks the walk, he's humble, he gives other people the credit, um, and he's just a man of his word. You, you just know, you know, to me, trust, and I know you have a lot more research 
research on this than me, isn't only are you telling the truth, although that's a part of it, obviously, that's a baseline, but it also means, you know, do you deliver on expectations? Are you reliable? Are you competent? And, and to me, he just checks off all those boxes. And when I see people like that, to me, those are the people that you just fall in love with and want to work with. Fantastic example. Often it isn't the big, the big celebrity show. It's the, it's the, uh, and, and being the same on stage and off stage, right? Just personally, Josh, thank you for spending these minutes with us, with all of our trusted leaders and just for giving your insight time. I've got so much here. I know I've got two pages of notes. Other people do as well. If they're not driving, I bet. So thank you. And thanks. Thank you. Most of all for being my friend. David, right back at you. Thank you so much for the great work that you do and continue to promote the uh, much, much needed trust in our world. So cheers to you and uh, let's keep being creative together. Absolutely. That's it for the Trusted Leader Show this time. Until next time, stay trusted.